They sat me in the chair for ages. They said it was all right, but can I at least have a mirror? Anybody? If you're feeling a little blue, well, join the club. This week, click Don's The Lycra to see how in the movies you really can be anything you want to be. Yet with the Oscars just around the corner, we're celebrating the cool tech that keeps us glued to our seats at the cinema. We find out how you send Sandra Bullock and George Clooney into space without an actual rocket. And we'll put our ears to the speaker and turn up to 11 for the very latest in sound. Plus, we have the latest news and some handy apps for any budding Spielbergs in Webscape. Welcome to Click. I'm Beppe the Blue Alien. And if you're not keen on my new look, let me assure you that my real appearance right now is even more disturbing. If you haven't seen this before, this is how computer-generated characters in movies and video games are created. A real actor will wear a motion capture or mocap suit like this covered in these highly reflective dots. And it's the movement of these dots around this virtual stage which is all important. There are 66 special cameras around me which are registering the movement of the dots which become joints and body parts onto which you can drop any kind of body you fancy, from a humanoid to a crazy cartoon character. Today we're at the studios of Audio Motion just outside Oxford. And while the set may look rather empty, the tech around it not only gives the post-production team complete freedom over an actor's appearance, but they can even alter their performance long after the shoot has taken place. You can start with the true performance that happened on the day, but you can also tweak it a little bit if you want to. You can embellish it or you can play it down. You can emphasize certain things or de-emphasize certain things. Um, and by recreating a shot world inside a computer, that fle flexibility exists. Even if the end result is a completely virtual character, performance capture still needs that human element, the performance artist wearing the suit. And in fact, it's ushering in a new breed of actor who's aware of both its possibilities and its restrictions. You have to make sure that balls don't get um, cloaked or hidden from the cameras. So if two actors get close together, for instance, then they're going to get hidden. So you have to make sure that movements stay far apart, or if they are together, then they don't stay that close for very long. And it enables us, especially on screen, to be able to do far more um, effects and, and make stunts safer, for instance. Um, so it's something um, that I think every actor should start to have on their, their repertoire. These days, it's also possible to see a fairly good version of the finished shot on set in real time, rather than having to wait for months of post-production. And that's handy if you're perfecting your Shakespearean remake of the Dirty Dancing routine. Never let you go. And if you don't have a hunky actor to lift you into the air, well, that's no problem either. Sometimes it is necessary to be up higher in this virtual space. For example, if I need to maintain an eye line with an actor who's down there. Well, that's fine. They can build you a set of steps. You can climb them and then in post, after the event, they can turn this into a virtual balcony, for example. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou? Romeo. Is this a good look? a performance for your consideration there. But while my Oscar dodging act can easily be caught by the cameras all around me, there is one area of my body that's a lot harder to pinpoint. And that's where this beast comes in. It's the very latest in facial capture technology. The helmet holds four high def cameras that sit just outside of the wearer's vision. Each one records data from dots of makeup that are strategically placed on the actor's face to help capture each tiny muscle movement. It is a step forward in accurately recreating an actor's performance, but it still does require a little bit of getting used to. Hello. With motion capture, you really have to enhance your expressions because you don't have the eyes. The eyes come later with the computer geniuses. So we have to either frown more if we're sad, smile more if we're happy, but not to the extreme, like it's a theatrical, over-the-top pantomime performance. 
Mm. Yes, so not overdoing it then is the key. But as we've learned, even my moves can now be reined in to the precise amount of flailing the director wants to see. And if said director really does want to get hands on, they can grab this mobile pseudo camera and see the shot from whatever angle they like. That said, no decision needs to be final these days. You can recreate the world that was shot on the day inside a computer and you can mess with camera angles after the fact. You can tweak performances, you can emphasise or de-emphasise. You've got that flexibility to be able to do more work after the shoot. But you're also capturing the truth of what happened on the day. And with all of these cameras capturing this virtual space, the sky's no longer the limit on where you can place your actors. And it is a setup like this which was used in a movie that many critics are calling a game changer in terms of how technology is used in film. Houston, this is mission specialist Ryan Stone. I am Structure and I'm drifting. Do you copy? Tipped to win big at the Oscars, Gravity may well have you actually believing that they sent Sandra Bullock and George Clooney into space. Its director, Alfonso Cuaron, originally wanted to make the film without using much computer generated imagery or CGI. That was an idea that wasn't shared by the visual effects supervisor Tim Weber and the team at the BAFTA winning effects house Framestore. I think that Tim Weber was, more, was less naive than me. From the get-go, he was saying, this is not going to work like this. You know, and I was, no, no, yes, we can do it. I really thought that we were going to be mostly practical, meaning in a more conventional way in which you build sets and you have your actors with their suits and, and you have wires and stuff. Criteria gravity is incredibly hard to achieve on a film. Um, what then in this film takes it a, a massive leap forward, so I'm going to say a step, but a massive leap forward is Alfonso's style, which he was pushing further than he had before, of the very long shots and, and uh, the immersive uh, you know, shots that sort of with a roaming camera. And Tim was very skeptical. He kept on saying, let's do all of those digital digitally. Uh, I was skeptical about the digital yeah. result. So, um, uh, so th then the dance began. <laughs> That digital dance resulted in a film that is about 80% CGI. In fact, sometimes the only real things on the screen are the actors' faces. Even their spacesuits were created on a computer, which overcame the problem of making the actors weightless. In fact, the entire movie was created in a low-resolution, so-called pre-visualization form first, before the actors stepped on set. It was used to calculate the movements of the robotic camera and also shown on the inside of this thing. Because this is the set. The light box was invented for this movie, and it's made of almost two million LEDs. It was used to simulate the correct lighting on the actors' faces and give them a frame of reference for everything that would be digitally added later. The International Space Station, for example, took 10 modelers working for about a year to create. And such was the complexity of the finished shot that each single frame would take about 50 hours to render fully. And the render was achieved by using the grunt processing power of about 15,000 CPUs. It's estimated that if the job had been done on a single core computer, it would have taken about 7,000 years. But even after the comparatively moderate five years of work, with the film ready to be delivered to the studio, the process wasn't quite done. We have to go, we have to go, go, go. We have finished and we were just hanging, chilling out. Uh, uh, talking about just generic things and, 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 and the visual effects producer next to Tim said, Charles said, uh, you know, the cool thing of this film is that you can watch it in any position. He took the computer and, 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 and flopped the whole thing. And is when I realized, wow, we, we, we screwed it. It should have been like that. So you were pretty much finished with Gravity and then Alfonso sees the first scene and he asks you to make quite a major change, doesn't he? To make a simple change, like flip the first two and a half minutes upside down, uh, took a couple of months. It, it's a big number because you have to then very slowly rotate the camera during this one continuous shot to get back to the right way up for the rest of the scene, which meant uh, reanimating, re-rendering. Something simple like that was, was a significant 
thing to do. Do it now! Oh. Okay, next up, a look at this week's tech news. Oh no, hat hair. There's been a backlash from users of the messaging service WhatsApp after Facebook bought it in the biggest internet deal in over a decade, worth 11 billion pounds. Many of the comments you've sent to us focus on worries over privacy and the introduction of ads. WhatsApp says it has more than 450 million active users and it's adding 1 million every day. Facebook boss Mark Zuckerberg said there were no plans to place ads on the service and that WhatsApp would continue to operate independently. Watch this space. Europe could soon be operating its own cordoned off portion of the internet if proposals by German Chancellor Angela Merkel win support among fellow European leaders. Motivated by the recent NSA revelations, her plans for the European Communications Network would see no emails or other data passing through US data centers. Critics, though, say the design of the internet makes it hard to restrict data traffic to geographic regions. And what happens when thousands of people try to play a video game simultaneously? Social gaming site Twitch is hosting a multiplayer version of the Game Boy classic Pokemon by typing one of eight commands in the video's chat, players can control the game one move at a time. But with hundreds of thousands of Pokemaniacs wrestling over the controls, they may have bitten off more than they can Pikachu. Now, not everyone has a Hollywood budget or a Hollywood crew to make their dream project. And that's why we asked David Reed to go to Paris to meet the filmmakers who are making movies not with traditional cameras, but with these, smartphones. The rules of France's mobile film festival are simple. Entrants have one minute to make their mark with judges like the leading French director Jean-Pierre Jeunet. He was 17 when he forked out a small fortune for his first camera. During the old time, it was expensive. You had to buy some pellicule, some print from Kodak. It was very difficult. You needed a lot of money. You might think that all you need now is a mobile, but not so fast. It's still tough to get to do this for a living. For those who win, the festival offers connections and cash, 15,000 euros, to nudge budding directors into full bloom. Uh, the major problem is, is the uh, financial problem, the means, always this movie industry, how you get in. Uh, Find some friends, uh, write a good story, have energy, be creative, and, and, and we will give you the means to go further. Mobile films have a familiar feel. The Nouvelle Vague of the 50s and 60s had directors shooting in natural light, in real homes, using jump cuts and stories left unresolved. Give up, I'm having Marmite. Mobile movies do something similar, giving us a glimpse behind the closed doors of aspiring filmmakers. Bathrooms, balconies, kitchens, car parks. So does this have the makings of a new genre? The films that win, strangely or maybe not so strangely, are the films that have that little flavour of being homemade that are a bit, shall we say, rough and ready. Sylvan should know, this year he won with The Vicious Circle, a cautionary tale of our times. Girl meets boy, boy proliferates intimacies of girl online, dire consequences ensue. Here he's taking some shots on the hoof, but this is him fully armed, tripod, digital audio gear and a fancy lead light. So what do you need to make a good movie? An idea, script, good actors, sure. But surprisingly, which camera is largely irrelevant? 
we don't care about if it's internet, computers, by end, camera with brrr, we don't care. Just find good ideas and tell good stories. David Reed on a subject that's got our cameraman Mike very worried indeed. Don't worry, Mikey, we will keep you on, I promise. That tea won't make itself, you know. Anyway, film isn't just about the visuals, of course. You only have to experience Hitchcock's psycho to hear how important sound can be. Well, after years of being afraid to go into the shower, Mark Chislak is about to pull back the curtain on the audio that could be coming to a cinema near you soon. Smart movie makers understand that sound matters. Based on a true story and starring Mark Wahlberg as a US Navy SEAL in Afghanistan, the film Lone Survivor has found itself Oscar nominated for both sound mixing and sound editing. We had a great sound department who understood that um, we wanted realism to put the audience into the, the sounds of war. War is loud and, and deafening and confusing and disorienting from just a sonic standpoint. And we wanted to try and capture that um, kind of audio experience. But to fully realize a movie maker's audio ambitions, cinemas and audiophiles have had to invest in dedicated sound setups. From mono to stereo, surround 5.1 and 7.1, the story of sound in cinema hasn't just been written by advances in technology which affect the quality of audio that's being reproduced. A big part is played by the number of speakers and channels that surround an audience and, most importantly, how they're used. But Dolby's engineers have created a system they've dubbed Atmos. They think that by adding speakers to an area which has previously been a speaker-free zone, they'll help to create a more immersive sense of surround sound. They pop them in the ceiling. It's not just about adding speakers, though. Audio can literally be moved around the room and placed in specific locations and speakers. The effect at times can be quite eerie, particularly if an object is supposed to be moving around you. Don't you hate it when you get buzzed by a computer-generated version of the 9th Air Cavalry? It's an object-based system. So we are taking audio items and making them objects that the sound designer or the director can move around within a, within a big soundscape, and we can reproduce that in the cinema. And it gives you a much more immersive, much more dynamic reproduction of the soundscape. Dolby's hoping to roll out the system in cinemas around the world and believes that it will future-proof cinema owners from further advances in audio technology. So any cinema has a calibrated sound system. Once the system has been installed, it will be calibrated by a qualified engineer. So you're getting essentially the same playback that the director heard in the mix studio where he mixed the movie. You're getting that in your local cinema, your local multiplex. Atmos takes that a little stage further on. The room design is programmed into the processor that replays the sound in the cinema. So the processor essentially knows where all the loudspeakers are, what their power handling capabilities are, and then it gets this map of audio of objects that it then has to re-render into the space. It's difficult to convey to you, the viewers at home, the difference this sort of audio setup makes to the cinema experience. Sounds seem to move around the viewer in an uncannily realistic fashion. If anything, systems like this prove that for movies, sound is just as important as vision. Mark Chislak, a man you can usually hear before you can see. OK, now it's over to our very own leading lady. Here comes Kate Russell with Webscape. Having peeked behind the cinema screen, you might be feeling inspired to get creative yourself. But you don't need a ticket to Hollywood, just point your browser at crowdsourcing collaboration platform Wreck-A-Movie. There are loads of projects or you can start one yourself, ranging from short films and animations to full-length feature films. Everyone is welcome, both amateur and professional. Just take a look at the tasks for a project and then let them know what you can do. We can! From looking amateurish, this community has already produced some truly impressive movies, complete with rich cinematography and stunning special effects. 
you'd be hard pushed to pick out films like this, Iron Sky, which was made by the Wrecker movie crowd on a budget of seven and a half million euros against a Hollywood sci-fi production costing ten times that or more. You could get involved in graphics, script writing, promotion, design or as a music composer. It's surprising how many roles there are when you get down to the nuts and bolts of producing a film. So sign up and get involved. Smartphone cameras produce a pretty good quality picture these days, but it's all academic if the person holding the camera doesn't know what they're doing. Or is it? Horizon is a brand new app that rotates and resizes your shot no matter what orientation you hold it at, producing amazing results from even the shakiest camera work. Any way that you want me. This is one of those apps that will make you go, wow. It uses the phone's gyroscope to recognise how you're holding the handset and adjust the rotation and scale of the shot to produce a seamless horizontal clip. Sadly, it's only available on current Apple mobile devices, the 4S and up for your phone, for example. But the developers told me they are considering an Android version in the future. It supports a range of aspect ratios and quality settings, although one potential downside here is the loss of resolution you'll get when a video is cropped and zoomed. This should only really be noticeable, though, when displaying the film on a large screen. But I've been watching you. From the best-selling Star Wars game series in history. Yeah. If you're just not the creative type, there are plenty of other ways to enjoy the world of cinema online and on your smartphone too. Just got bigger. Lego Star Wars is the perfect example of a Hollywood franchise that's been exploited in many forms for your general entertainment. Check out these great online games, desktop wallpaper downloads, cute little films and a slew of entertaining apps mainly for iPhone and Android. May the Force be with you, young Padwan. Rescue mission I must launch. Oh, a trap it is! There are a lot of initiatives around right now encouraging children to learn to code, and this week's Video of the Week picks up on that baton and gives it a movie-style shake-up, with Bill Gates explaining the principles of computer programming using zombies, courtesy of Code.org. Left. And you can see if we do that, if we're taking the turns to the left and otherwise moving forward, we'll achieve our goal. Thanks, Kate, and Kate's links are all up online if you need them. bbc.co.uk slash click is our website address. And if you'd like to get in touch, you can. We're on email, click at bbc.co.uk, and we're also knocking about Twitter, Google Plus, and Facebook too. That's it for now, though. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.